M disc that is uh, regarding the spinal cord injury. I'm planning this lecture in the following headings. First, I would tell about briefly about spinal cord injury. Then I define what is a spinal shock. Then I will tell or I will describe about the stages of the spinal shock and the chronological events after spinal shock. Then the physiological mechanisms responsible for the spinal shock and then summary. This is uh, the plan of lecture today. Here I am presenting the magnitude of the problem. Because of the increase in the motor vehicles, especially the motorbikes, and these motorbikes are under the control or control of the young, energetic, highly active people, youth. And uh, the adrenergic activity is very high and um, they go with a very high speed and uh, all those things. What I mean to say that uh, road accidents, uh, especially the two wheelers, two wheelers, uh, motorbikes, uh, we go with a very high speed because uh, they are, um, they move with a very high, sudden pickup and with high velocity. Then some work related injuries because it, it may be a construction worker or other uh, hard uh, laborer who is working suddenly he is subjected to the injury of the vertebral column because of the the work involvement that is the labor class and uh, that is fine. One side, I have put the youth there. In the youth, the road accidents associated with the motorbikes. I'm not telling that others also, other accidents are also prone because these are increasing in number. So the number of accidents are increasing. And if the number of accidents are increasing, the spinal cord injuries are increasing. Then another group of people, the old age people, who have osteoporosis, the bones have become brittle and they can easily fracture. So they sleep in the bathroom and then they sustain an injury and then uh, they will have that uh, uh, spinal cord involvement. So you, you see that uh, the spinal cord damage is there in any of these things uh, and they account for the large number of uh, um, the eventuality and death and even not if not death the uh, morbidities or incapacitation because if he goes into a paraplegia where he is bedridden throughout life so because of this uh, this uh, this particular topic becomes an important even from the first year onwards uh, till you take up the neurology neurosurgery or any other uh, uh, internal medicine or uh, surgical aspects. More than half of the injuries, that is the spinal cord injuries, they produce a disability. That's what I am trying to talk about. You will not be able to walk or even if you are walking, you are have walking with a, some amount of, uh, uh, you will not be in your full, full form including impairment of motor sensory functions and uh, the disruption of the voluntary act or voluntary control and the voluntary control of okay the muscles is all right the loss of the voluntary control of the bowel and bladder is a real big problem uh, to the patient to the doctor treating to the nurse so that means uh, the problem is uh, uh, it's a real big problem in terms of, or it's a challenge uh, to the physician or to the medical person. The spinal cord injury can be partial or can be complete. 
if it is complete, uh, say for example, I'm starting with uh, the complete uh, spinal cord injury. It happens in the neck region. That means the entire, all the four limbs, four limbs, the upper limb and both the lower limbs, uh, they become uh, paralyzed. That is called a quadriplegia. That's a loss, loss of control over all four limbs, quadriplegia. Or if it is uh, below the thoracic level, T6 or uh, some T6 level, then it will be a paraplegia. Paraplegia means the lower, lower limb control is lost. This is a complete transaction of the um, uh, spinal cord. If you have seen a picture I had posted here, so this is uh, the thing in the cervical region. In this cervical region, there is a fracture of the vertebra. This is the vertebra. And this fracture of the vertebra has resulted in uh, the damage to this, this part of the spinal cord. And uh, naturally, we expect a control, uh, loss of control over all the four limbs, the quadriplegia in this particular uh, individual. Now, coming back here, that is about the complete transaction. There may be another incidence, the partial uh, injury. That means either a dorsal root is damaged or a ventral root gets damaged. Maybe because of disease, maybe because of the trauma or injury. Or there may be a bullet shot injury in which only particular quadrant of the spinal cord is damaged. So that means I'm talking about one fourth year, the quadrant of a particular thing. Or in terms of the vascular injury, where the anterior horn is totally lost because of the uh, anterior uh, spinal artery is being blocked, anterior horn injury. Or because of the tumor growing, or because of the cavitation of the central canal. The cavitation of the central canal, it is expanding, and that is called a syringomyelia. This is a disease in which the central cavity is uh, enlarging. So that means it uh, involves the central part of the, the spinal cord. Or it, the, some diseases which involve uh, the posterior horn, the dorsal horn. So these are the tips, dorsalis and uh, subacute combined degeneration, which results from the deficiency of the vitamin B12. Or there may be a, a transection of the spinal cord partially that is called a hemisection, what we call it as a one half of the one half of the spinal cord is uh, uh, cut. So that means it is uh, it is something like that uh, from lateral to medial, uh, the one half is cut or severe. So that may happen because of the sharp injury. The spinal cord injury, what I classified here, the partial or complete, whatever. So they produce a certain uh, effects. Maybe here I will, uh, I will just tell about the complete transaction of the spinal cords leads to loss of all sensations. Suppose uh, if it is uh, what I have shown there, if, the, if it is uh, uh, cut here, somewhere here, uh, the, it may lose all the, all the sensations uh, uh, going up or not reaching all the the motor activity or not the, the voluntary control of the motor activity below this uh, segment or lost so besides that uh, because it involves the the uh, thoracic and uh, the lumbar segments the sympathetic uh, the bladder and bowel controls are also lost because uh, the parasympathetic component coming from the sacral and the sympathetic component coming from the uh, thoracolumbar uh, outflow, they are uh, not there. So this, this is, that means the whatever the control system here is not coming. So they will be losing. One interesting thing, if the, the section or if the damage is above C3 or above C4, that means uh, above this level, what happens? that individual may not come to you at all. Because what happens, uh, this is the level uh, in which uh, you get uh, the, you will get the respiratory paralysis. 
The diaphragm is a C4 level. I'm talking above C4 means a, a diaphragmatic paralysis. That means a, a respiratory uh, thing, uh, total control on the respiratory. Because what happens, the respiratory neurons present in the medulla and the pons, uh, the respiratory centers or uh, inspiratory centers, uh, they will send impulses to the, the cervical and the thoracic region wherein the chest movement is taking place chest and the diaphragmatic movement is taking place and that would be expanding the chest. That is not happening. So that means that the person may die or he may not come to you at all. He will die instantly. So that means uh, the lesion above C3 where respiration is affected. So spinal cord ends. You just see here, the spinal cord ends somewhere here. You just see, see this, this part here. Uh, here, somewhere here, and uh, this ending uh, bonus medullaris. Maybe, uh, maybe in the next uh, here we have. So this this is having a, a something like a cone. This is a conus medullaris. Here it ends about uh, the at the level of the L2 and L1. You can just see that L1 or L2. This is conus medullaris. And after that, you have these fibers, uh, these roots coming up. These are very long roots, uh, like a tail of the horse, they are coming up. This is called equina. If the damage is here, uh, the damage is only to the particular roots uh, which are involved in the damage. Here, it is a conus medullaris, and this is a cauda equina. So that means the spinal cord ends at L2. This is the ending point. The lesion just above this interrupts the conus medullaris. If it is at L2 level or L1 level, it is the conus medullaris. So that means all these uh, uh, the roots coming up, uh, they are damaged. The below L2 lesions, uh, they will be involving these roots, roots coming from here. This is called a cardioquina syndrome, and they will cause a sensory loss uh, to the regions they supply, especially perineal region which is supplied by the lower lumbar and uh, sacral tunnels. Okay, with this uh, brief uh, idea about the various aspects of the spinal injury, the effects of spinal injury involve immediate, delayed, and long-term effects. The immediate effect is manifested as a spinal shock. Delayed effects is a recovery, and the, some effects associated with the loss or interruption of the, uh, the traffic, the impulse traffic going to the brain or coming from the brain. Then long-term effects, whether that could be able to produce a recovery or trying to evolve or the disease evolves or the injury evolves, uh, what it does. So this is a long-term these are the effects of the spinal injury. What we are concerned here is about the immediate effect. This is called a spinal shock. If you open up the English dictionary, it is a state of non-responsiveness. So here the spinal shock is a sudden a state of non-responsiveness to any of the events. But the spinal shock, when we call, it is a sudden immediate loss of control on all functions of the, uh, the spinal cord. So I have mentioned the spinal cord has a sensory function, motor functions, autonomic functions, and the reflex uh, functions. All these things are lost because of the spinal cord injury. Sudden and immediate loss of control. So that means the spinal cord is dependent upon the information uh, or it is uh, dependent upon the, the information coming from the brain and brain stem because uh, rather it is dependent, dependent on the uh, inputs from brain and brain stem. Now those inputs are not coming because it's cut. So whatever information coming, it's not reaching to the spinal cord. That is why there is a sudden loss of control. That is one, the spinal shock. Now, when, or the definition could be otherwise when a transaction is complete, 
immediately after the accident, all the spinal reflexes or the spinal functions below the level of the lesion are completely absent. Total absence of the functions. That is uh, another definition. And this is known as spinal shock. Or you can, you can put it in these words. It is a state of areflexia. Caudal to spinal cord injury following complete transaction of the spinal cord. Now, the shock here, the sudden cut, sudden cut the spinal cord, what I had shown in the first picture there, and the, there is a total disruption of the information coming from the brain and brain stem to the spinal cord. And uh, the dependence, because the spinal cord is dependent upon the information which is coming and uh, trying to obey the orders, suddenly it is not coming and uh, it does not uh, it goes into a state of uh, non-responsiveness. So now, during the course weeks, so now this non-responsiveness does not stay forever. During the course of a week, days and weeks and months, the reflexes gradually return because uh, the, there are spinal reflexes which operate at the segmental level. They return. And uh, they, some of them would be becoming exaggerated. They, they, they will produce the hyper responsiveness. And uh, in that one example is even a simple touch of the skin of the foot may elicit a very strong withdrawal or flexion or withdrawal of the leg. So this is uh, about the recovery. So that means uh, what I mean to say, the recovery takes place from days to weeks to months. Uh, and slowly the spinal segmental activity begins to resume. Now let us see uh, this. Thus, whatever the spinal shock, the non-responsiveness goes into three stages. One stage is a stage of placidity. The second stage is a appearance of the reflex activity. And the third stage is a the final failure of the reflex activity, that means the reflex activity, whatever has been recovered, it, it fails or it disappears. So this is a time dependent. So the placidity is at the beginning, then recovery happens in days, months and uh, years, and then uh, it may happen in, in the time, time period mentioned in the re re appearance stage. Now, these are stages of placidity. So let us see what is that, what happens there. This is the stage one, the stage of placidity. What happens to the motor activity? The motor activity receives inputs from the corticospinal tract and the reticulospinal tract to the gamma motor neurons and the corticospinal tract from for the alpha motor neuron, vestibulospinal tract, and so many tracts are coming, they are governing the motor activity, they are all paralyzed. So there will be flaccid paralysis. That means that they are dropping. That, that means that they, they don't, uh, they don't ha have any activity. The reflex is, if you get a muscle tone, muscle tone is a reflex activity, which is generated from the gamma, motor neuron because of the activation of the intrafusal fibers, the 1A are uh, activated, then that produces uh, the alpha motor, that is a gamma alpha link is lost, there is atonia, there is a areflexia or atonia. So the tone is lost, it is flaccid, it drops down. Hence, the position of the limb is determined by the cavity. If you just uh, trying to uh, leave the or lift the limb and leave it there, and it will drop down like a dead object or non-living object. Otherwise, uh, what happens if I leave this thing? Maybe I hold the limb at a particular uh, uh, position. Uh, what I expected to keep it, or it will not drop down here because I measure the table. Then there. The sensory system, there will be a loss of sensation 
because all the sensations carried by the spinal cord to the brain are cut. They are not going up. So they are lost. However, a cramp-like pain is seen at the level of the region where it is cut because the there will be irritation of these uh, some neurons and they will be increased activity. They will produce the lesion. So that is a sensory system. But uh, below the level of the lesion, absolutely loss of all sensation going upwards. Then third component is the autonomic paralysis. What happens if the lesion, because the thoracolumbar outflow controls the sphincter VCK and the rectum. So they, the sphincters of the bladder and the sphincters of the rectum are lost. There is no control. And if there is no control, there will be uh, what happens. So the, all the bladder in continuous, uh, uh, what is called incontinence. So the, the urine start flowing without any or the, even the incontinence of the feces the, because the bowel control is lost. So this uh, autonomic paralysis, uh, what happens, the sp sphincter VCK, because this is controlled by the sympathetic system. But this recovers soon, earliest possible. So maybe within hours it recovers. So that means the sphincter VCK starts contracting. The sphincter VCK is the, the sphincter uh, which controls the bladder, uh, urinary bladder outflow. So now it will, it will resume its activity. Once it resumes its activity, it con constricts. If the sphincter VCK control constricts, but what happens? The urine flow is coming, but this, is, this constriction has no control because the sensation is not reaching the brain. It will not tell that the bladder is full or bladder is, uh, I have to uh, go for the urination. So that control is lost. In that case, the, the bladder getting filled up, what is called a retention of urine. At the same time, what happens? There is a paralysis of the, the parasympathetic component. Parasympathetic component or the detrusor muscle or the uh, urinary bladder smooth muscle is covered by the, the pelvic parasympathetic component, pelvic no, sacral segment. This sacral segment is also not uh, and the, is not is lost the control. So that means there is a relaxation, relaxation or atonia of the bladder and the sphincteric mechanism. These two things results in a retention of urine, and this becomes a challenge for the treating uh, physician. So that means uh, now you have to empty the bladder in to to relieve the retention because otherwise he will not he does not have a control over the bladder. He will just keep accumulating the urine uh, in the blood. Then the penile musculature, or especially, it becomes placid and the erection is impossible because the sacral segments are under the control. The sacral parasympathetics lost the control. Now, what happens if the level of the lesion is between a T1 and L2? level depending upon the level what happens in the t1 level this t1 level supplies the heart and all the blood vessels and this is a thoracolumbar outflow this is the where uh, the sympathetics are going up and these sympathetics control the blood pressure now if it is cut the blood pressure falls because the sympathetic tone what other day i was talking about uh, the vagal uh, tone. Now, sympathetic is also having a tonic activity, and this uh, tonic activity, which is uh, increasing the blood pressure, and if it is cut, uh, the sympathetic tone is lost, and the sympathetic tone uh, increases the blood pressure, and if it is lost, there is a fall in blood pressure. So that is uh, one of the things uh, which happens, if, and this again depends upon the level of the lesion. Higher the lesion, greater the fall. If it is higher up, because the more and more uh, uh, blood vessels and even heart is involved. 
And if the lesion is below the lumbar segment, second lumbar segment, there may not be much change in the blood pressure because uh, already the thoracolumbar outflow is done. The sympathetic uh, outflow is lost and the blood pressure may not uh, be as much fall. So then what happens another aspect about the venous return? Now, venous return is linked with the two components. One component is the skeletal muscle contraction. The skeletal muscle tone drives the, the venous blood from the periphery to the heart, especially from the lower extremity, from the lower limb. If there is no muscle tone in the lower limb, so then uh, what happens? The, the pump, the peripheral pump, what we call as a second heart or the peripheral heart, it's not working, especially the, the soleus gastrocnemius complex. If that is not working, the, the blood will not uh, be pushed up. That is a, uh, the loss of a tone, that is the skeletal pump. At the same time, sympathetic paralysis is also there. Both of them together, the venous return is decreased. Now, decreased venous return adds further to the loss of blood pressure. Because of the loss of the control, on the, the blood vessels, the limbs become cold and because of the stagnation of the blood, they will become blue or cyanosed. They become cold because they are not, there is a uh, vascular atonia and they, they will become cold and blue. Now, what happens? The sympathetics control the sweating mechanism. Now, sympathetics are cut, said, depending upon the level of the lesion. Suppose if it is be below L2, so naturally it may not affect. But between T1 and L2, definitely it will be loss of sweating concerning the areas of the skin it supplies. So skin becomes dry. If there is no sweating, the skin becomes dry. And at the same time, the... The blood supply to the skin is suffers because the blood supply is not uh, because there is no proper blood supply. And now because of that, and at the same time, there may be some pressure effects. Say, suppose if I am sitting here or if somebody is sleeping, sleeping on the bed, so they all the blood because of the, this thing, they will be pulling down and there is a pressure of the body surface. There is a pressure. And that would produce the pressure effect. And even a small movement, the friction, this friction, the loss of blood supply, the pressure effect, all of them are put together that would produce uh, what are called uh, the ulcerations or source. These are called a pressure source or med source. So that means uh, uh, skin is not vital now it's a non-vital or it is non because of the loss of the blood supply it will be this thing it is more prone for the pressure and medicines so this is another problem so now i'm i'm trying to tell you one problem i mentioned about the the bladder function the second problem now i'm talking about the development of bed source or the pressure source it may not be bed source on the buttock, maybe uh, on the scapular area wherein it, it falls on the uh, bed. About T6 level, the abdominal visceral sensations are lost because most of the abdominal viscera are supplied by uh, T6 and uh, down lumbar segment. Now, if the level is above T6, the, the all the visceral sensations are carried by this, they are lost. This is about the stage of placidity and the stage of placidity is due to the loss of motor activity, loss of reflex activity, the loss of sensory uh, information reaching and uh, autonomic paralysis that is leading to the decreased venous return, the skin uh, and uh, the visceral component. This is a stage of placidity. How long it remains? That's one question. It may remain for one to three days. 
anyway it's not the stage of flaccidity is not due to the fall of blood pressure as if it is due to the fall of blood pressure because if there is a cut the blood pressure should affect the entire body so that means the upper suppose if it is cut at the t6 level the upper extremity or upper limb they may be not may be having a functional functionally okay so that means the spinal shock happens caudal to the injury or distal to the injury and uh, it is not due to the type of trauma type of trauma i mean to say that a transaction either tearing cutting or uh, any type of uh, treatments independent of the type of uh, trauma and it has been seen that uh, second cut or a lesion below the level after recovery suppose if I, if there is a person who has undergone this spinal lesion and after some days the second cut was made and then there is no effect on this uh, spinal shock so that means a, a spinal shock is a phenomena which results from the lack of uh, inputs from the higher brain stem and uh, the brain levels duration and intensity of the shock depends on the degree of encephalization of the enema that means uh, the development of the brain of the enema let us see that so now here i come the spinal scope is much shorter in animals than in human beings what i mentioned the degree of encephalization the spinal shock in frogs so you you see the i am just trying to come back from the lower lower vertebrae so it may be within minutes it will recover minutes to hours so cats and dogs maybe few hours it will recover in primates non human primates it may be within less than a week in man the spinal shock recovers from 3 to 4 weeks that means the recovery is to a level maybe we will see to it what are the various events happening after the spinal cord surgery so what what i mean to say that giving this data the longer recovery periods in humans if you are looking at the the humans are the creatures with the two two legs bipedal they have a bipedal locomotion this bipedal locomotion is more complex because you have to have the uh, posture maintained the activity maintained and it is more complex and once it is more complex uh, there are more circuitries involved more brain involvement uh, that is why there is a longer recovery period longer recovery period of for humans reflect the greater dependence of the spinal circuitry from the descending inputs the initial shock is considered to be due to the sudden withdrawal of a, a tonic facilitatory influence from the brain and brain stem that is what i was uh, uh, trying to impress upon you sudden withdrawal it will influence all the sphincter vesicle once it recovers it contracts the then the dritrosar muscle comes slowly dritrosar muscle that is uh, the contraction of the dritrosar muscle is uh, happening slowly so that means slowly it comes but the sphincter is a uh, first one to be uh, relieved so re this is in a purin require uh, the active involvement from the uh, treating uh, um physician surgeon that catheterization you introduce a catheter so that you drain the urine so that the the urinary bladder is not full the second part the stage of appearance of the reflex activity the first one is the sphincteric then vaso vasomotor tone the vascular tone that is the blood vessels are some supplied by the sympathetic especially the precapillary sphincters they are supplied and that will produce the the sympathetic tone and it is uh, now this sympathetic tone is under the control of the medulla medullary things coming the descending medullary uh, inputs 
these medullary inputs are governed by the uh, hypothalamus uh, and amygdala. So now this control, now what is happening, these are disrupted, they will try to have their own automaticity. So that means uh, they will, the sympathetic activity, the intermediolateral cells of the neurons in the spinal cord, they regain their automaticity, they, they, their freedom. So then they become independent, they start acting. That is, uh, the tone starts resuming. The recovery of the muscle tone takes uh, somewhere around two to three weeks. In that, the muscle tone in flexor group of muscle recovers first than the extensors. The flexors are the first one to recover than the extensor. And the extent to which the recovery takes place, the flexors are greater than the extensors. So that means uh, I had told two things about flexors. The first one to recover, then greater recovery in case of flexors, than as compared to extensor. So because of this, what happens? The paraplegia. So now if the flexors are uh, resuming, the, the muscles uh, contract, muscles contract, so muscles flex. This is called a, a paraplegia inflection that indicate the, the activity of the flexor. The, it will never come to the original level, original uninterrupted level in the normal healthy person. So hypotonia remains persists. Since there is a segmental reflex activity, the segmental reflex activity is talking about uh, the outflow of the nerve growth factors from the uh, alpha motor neurons. There is no wasting of the muscles. In case of a lower motor neuron lesion, where there is a cut of the anterior horn cell or ventral horn cell, there may be a wasting. Otherwise, there is no wasting because the activity on the muscle, muscle tone is there, a partial state of contraction is happening, so that would be keeping the muscle in a healthy state or a little bigger. Because the flexor is already taking up on the upper hand, the extensor at the lower side, involuntary flexor movements appear. And the reciprocal inhibition of the extensor, because at the same time when the flexor group of muscles are activated, the extensors are inhibited. And if the extensors are inhibited, again, it goes into flexion. So that will talk about, uh, again, the paraplegia in flexion. Then the fifth component, the flexor reflexes. Flexor reflexes are the withdrawal reflexes. So the withdrawal reflexes are those which respond to the noxious stimulus. That means the touching of the heart plate with the drawing the hand or uh, uh, keeping uh, uh, something on the uh, thorn or the foot you are putting on the uh, splinter of the glass. So then uh, you will just try to withdraw the foot. So these are withdrawal reflexes to the noxious system. Uh, they, would, uh, they would return first. They would return first. So for that reason, Babinski sign, Babinski sign, uh, it's a plantar reflex. So that means a scratching of the sole of the foot. And uh, when we scratch the sole of the foot in the normal individuals, it is a flexor response. It's a, it, is, it, produces, it gives a flexor response. But in this situation, uh, it becomes extensor. That means uh, the toe is extended, the dorsi uh, extension of the toe and uh, fanning of the other toes. So that will talk about the extensor response. So this is called a Babinski positive. So this is about uh, the stage of reflex activity. I have mentioned about uh, how what's happening to the smooth, the first, which one is the first, then muscle tone, uh, vasomotor tone, then muscle tone, then reflex movements, then flexor reflexes. Then comes the, the mass reflex. So this mass reflex, uh, it will happen because already the withdrawal reflex is coming up. So maybe after three to six months, maybe uh, what happens, a uh, uh, widespread massive flexor reaction is seen after scratching any point in the lower limb. This happens after several months. 
So this is known as a mass reflex. The widespread massive flexor reaction. What are those flexor reactions? So the flexor reaction is withdrawal. That means a leg is withdrawn. First, it, it happens the flexion at the knee, uh, flexion at the uh, the ankle, then the knee, then in the hip and the abdominal muscles. So that means uh, that would produce the flexor spasm of both the lower limbs, the abdominal muscles, along with the crossed extensor reflex. So that means uh, if this is withdrawn, if uh, a right limb is withdrawn, the left will go into an extension. So then at the same time, this flexor response, that will also activate the, the autonomic responses. There would be evacuation of the bladder, the bladder, the muscle detritus are muscle contracts due to two aspects. The abdominal muscle uh, produces the spasm and uh, the intra-abdominal pressure increases that empties the bladder. That's one aspect. And uh, also the increased uh, um, the contraction. Maybe it is the, the first component is the abdominal muscles contract and that is as a part of the flexor response. So that would increase the intravesical pressure. And there will be an increased act sympathetic activity. And this increased sympathetic activity uh, results in a sweating of whole body. Now, here, what I have mentioned here, uh, T1, T2, head and face. Suppose if it is the level of the lesion is uh, T1 and T2, head and face are involved. Suppose if it is at a T3 level, so then these may be spare. If there is a level T5 to T9, it is supplying the arm. arm. Suppose the level is around the T10, so then uh, this will be spare. So that is why I am giving this. So T1 and T2, if that level, so that head and face sweating will be there or below that they are spared. If this the level of the lesion cut or whatever injury is below the level of the T10, so then these arms are spared, arms, head, face are spared. Thus, the level of the lesions are below, above T1, whole body sweating uh, because of the sympathetic stimulation. This mass reflex also elicits the cremastric and dartus muscle contraction. This seizures reflex is activated because of the uh, contraction of the cremastric muscle and the, the uh, dartos muscle. Dartos muscles are the smooth muscles in the, uh, they will try to hold the uh, scrotum. Scrotum, the cremastric is uh, lifting the testicles and this is a scrotal uh, muscle contraction that is uh, lifting the scrotal sac upper. So that is uh, the coitus reflex. Then the contraction of the rectus abdominis, contraction of the hip flexors, then the adductors of the thigh, all these things are involved in the coitus, they are activated. So now it may end up in the erection of the penis and it may end up in the ejaculation of the semen. So that means the, the mass reflex, which maybe after six months in these individuals, and you scratch his limb, it will produce a, a series of uh, reflex activities, starting from the flexor spasm of both the lower limbs, abdominal muscles, and extensor, evacuation of bladder, a sweating, the a, excitation or triggering the quietus reflex, and uh, leading to erection and emission. Uh, this is what the total mass reflex. Now, coming back, there is a I have just uh, mentioned about a quietus reflex here again. I'm dealing again uh, in this uh, this thing. Quietus reflex is elicited after this thing. Maybe it happens after six months. A stimulation of the glands penis or skin around penis or the inner thighs or the anterior abdominal wall leads to swelling and the stiffening of penis of the scrotal skin that is because of the daltus muscle contraction the abdominus and the hip uh, uh, the for mouth case of coit and uh, the seminal emission is because of the uh, activities have appeared at three weeks so that means after another five weeks of the uh, 
the extensors uh, uh, or the uh, the deep tunnel reflexes uh, start appearing. Initially, these reflexes are very feeble. There is a flicker of the muscle contraction. I, I mentioned about uh, the reflex in the reflexes, uh, different grades of the reflexes. Uh, it's grade one, uh, that means a flicker or a feeble contraction of the muscle. Now, initially, there will be feeble contraction. Slowly, this contraction, that means uh, as the days pass, this contraction becomes, uh, contraction of the muscle become evident. However, the reflexes uh, will not be as great as in normal. They remain feeble, maybe at the level two only, not uh, greater than grade two. So now, after six months, that means uh, one to five weeks after six months or later, there was an increased extensor activity. Okay, these are the data which were obtained in a, in a, in a persons or soldiers who, who were who were uh, injured in World War Two. This is the data uh, from them. It is mentioned. That is why I am telling the World War Two. So this uh, extensor activity since our tone is seen after six months uh, in these uh, soldiers who have got the injury, the spinal injury. So now ankle jerk and knee jerk gets exaggerated. So after this uh, around somewhere around six, so it will sudden jerky uh, 1B that is a Golgi tendon or so both, uh, both of these things operate one after another that would produce the clonus. That means uh, uh, the stretch reflex and the universal stretch reflex are happening one after another in CD. Usually they are inhibited. So there is oscillations that is clonus. Passive stretch and it becomes rigid. So this positive uh, support or uh, positive support uh, response. Uh, this is supporting reaction. That means as if it is going to give the rigid stand or a pillar-like structure. Uh, there is appearance of a mass reflex uh, as uh, described earlier. Now, recovery of the autonomic reflexes. Reflex evacuation of the bladder and the bowel may occur. So, this can happen. Skin is dry and scaly. There is no sweating. However, after some days, I, I mentioned about the autonomic activity resumes in, and now the skin which was cold and blue, now it becomes warm and uh, uh, resuming its origin. Sensory, autonomic, mass reflex, coitus reflex, and uh, the various events, how they are recovering. Now, coming back here, the infection. Infection is because of the uh, the person may be having, a, he's lying down, he may have a pneumonia, or the most usually he, he develops uh, the bed source. The bed source uh, get infected and there will be an infection. So infection and a toxic hearing, it disappears. And uh, now you require a greater strength of stimulus to activate the reflexes, whether it is a flexor reflex or the deep tendon reflex. Now, because the muscles are not in use, because there is a loss of the reflexes, the muscles are not in use, they become placid and atrophic. They are, there is a wasting. And all these things, because there is a loss of the uh, wasting, loss of tone, the bed sores are already developed and they will further compromise the blood circulation to the skin and uh, the circulation is compromised, ulceration, skin is ischemic and this uh, develop, keeps on going and the bed sore development, bed sore development produces infection, infection further produces all these things, this further produces so a sort of a uh, vicious cycle develops. This vicious cycle development results in the failure of the reflex activities. And finally, ultimately, he, he will succumb to the toxemic uh, level. And this was happening. So nowadays, uh, uh, it is not seen because uh, we have anti good antibiotics. We can uh, control the infection. And once we can control the infection, 
we can control the toxemic uh, uh, symptoms. So, so this is a uh, stage three is not uh, seen as seen earlier before the invention of the antibiotics. Now, uh, to summarize, the spinal cord injury results in immediate and delayed changes in the functions of the spinal cord. The immediate changes manifest as a spinal shock. This is a state of non-responsiveness of the spinal activity due to sudden loss or withdrawal of the suprasegmental influences caudal to the injury. I define here again one more time. A state of non-responsiveness of spinal activity due to sudden loss of suprasegmental influences caudal to the injury. Okay, non-responsiveness because of the loss of control from the super, superior or the superior portion, superior part of the uh, spinal cord. The spinal shock manifests and recovers in three different phases. Stage of areflexia, loss of autonomic functions, bladder and bowel control, and uh, the damage to the cutaneous circulation, they become important uh, at this uh, stage because they produce uh, the bladder uh, become getting pulled up and filled up uh, and that would produce the uh, problem. Or uh, because of the cutaneous circulation, the skin become uh, da skin is damaged, a bit sort of. Then second stage is the stage of reflex activity in which uh, uh, stage of reflex activity and hyperreflexia in which uh, the deep tendon reflexes and withdrawal reflexes. Withdrawal reflexes are the flexor reflexes. They are the first one to recover and the recovery of these things produces the flexor, uh, the paraplegia infection. Then there is a recovery of the autonomic reflexes. Then the flexor reflexes are the withdrawal reflexes. Uh, the plantar reflex is one of them. So it becomes an extensor. The bladder and bowel reflexes uh, reappear. There is a control of these. The patient enters into a stage of a hyperreflexia. This hyperreflexia exhibits as a mass reflex. Mass reflex. This mass reflex leads to a sort of a uh, entire uh, bodily reaction. That means uh, that is not only with a flexor withdrawal, uh, uh, the spasm, flexor spasm, there would be autonomic uh, overactivity or exaggerated autonomic responses in terms of the evacuation of the bladder or emission of the semen. Uh, in the stage of failure of the reflex activity, late, this is the latest stage due to toxemia resulting from uncontrolled infection, lack of personal hygiene, that is bed sore and its infection. The toxemia result in suppression of the reflexes and eventually death. This stage is not seen nowadays because of the availability of the antibiotics and other treatment strategies. The assignment for today, I will just give you, define spinal shock, describe different stages of spinal shock. This will come as a full question. Then write short notes on spinal shock, stage of areflexia, stage of spinal, stages of spinal shock, here I have made three stages, the mass reflex, the hyperreflexia. Then you talk about autonomic reflexes in the spinal cord injury. These are the assignments. Uh, the reference books, especially I have uh, uh, this, this part, I have taken it from uh, mostly from the uh, Samsung Pipes Applied Physiology, uh, Candles book and uh, Guidance textbook or economics. Uh, textbook. Now, next class, uh, that means uh, tomorrow, I will deal with uh, the physiological basis of the spinal shock and its treatment strategies. Okay, thank you.